introduction from Oh, recording in progress. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Natalie and I'm a sales manager here at Relative. And I'm going to be talking to you about some research we've run across the media and entertainment industry, looking at how to create the perfect content and understanding what motivates different audiences. We're then moving on to our speakers for today. And joining us, we have Simon Williams, who is the head of audience and content planning at the Royal Opera House in London who will be talking to us about how a historical institute like the Opera House must diversify its offering to delight a new generation of opera fans without alienating their traditional opera lovers. And then we have Angelina Icherian, who will be explaining the challenges of communicating successfully with the various tribes of gym goers. And then lastly, we'll have five or 10 minutes at the end for a Q&A. And just a little bit of housekeeping on this. So you should see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And as and when your questions arise, just pop them into the box alongside who you'd like me to direct your question to, and I'll make sure that happens. Ooh. So to kick things off, at Relative Insight, we do one of these spotlight events once every two months. And we try to pick, pick something that's relevant to us, but also really relevant to our customers. So why did we pick media and entertainment? Well, it's an industry we work really closely with and following a bit of a slump during the pandemic, particularly with in-person entertainment, these industries have rebounded really strongly due to the acceleration of power shifts that were already transforming the industry. And it's now set for huge growth, which is mostly fueled by demand for digital content. So it's looking like pandemic consumption patterns are here to stay. But that's not to say that the passion for live experiences won't live on. And it's already really clear that demand for these are also rebounding in full force, whether that's live gigs, spin classes, or theatre shows and festivals and fun things like that. And the movie theatre revival is also very much underway, which was clearer than ever when the new Spider-Man film broke box office records. And basically, we want to help the companies behind all of this stay competitive, but importantly, stay agile and evolve with their audiences. And for those of you who don't know what we do that well, we are a text comparison platform. And we basically help companies understand what makes their audiences unique, how their needs and behaviors change, and how they perceive different brands within a market. And nowadays, it's all too easy to get caught up thinking in terms of engagement numbers and resonance when it comes to our audiences, because creating engaging content has become the North Star of commercial success. But brands, organizations, and influencers need to know who their audiences are if they're to go beyond that and truly entertain and delight them. So we did some research to understand exactly what audience is like, as well as what motivates them to see, attend, or read something in the first place. So this first one is a piece I ran. And as I alluded to at the start, oops, sorry, through the pandemic, people gravitated more and more towards online streaming. And there's no denying that Netflix and Amazon are two of the largest players in that industry, but it's becoming increasingly competitive and consumers are using their original content as a factor in their purchase decision. So some stats for you. In 2021, Amazon spent nearly $10 billion on content and previously spent $250 million just for the rights to the new Lord of the Rings series, which I am very excited for. And that seems like a heck of a lot of money, but Netflix topped that with a 14 billion spend last year, and a hefty portion of that would have been allocated to original content. A good example of what they've done previously is their 2019 film, The Irishman, which is one of their most watched movies ever and cost around $160 million, largely thanks to some anti-aging special effects. They also did House of Cards, which was Netflix's attempt at a completely data-driven approach to content creation where they looked at patterns of preference from their user base to formulate a show around it, meaning in theory, they'd created the ideal show for their users. But my point is, how do we make these immense investments in original content pay off? And how do we get people to love what they're seeing? So I ran some research and went to some popular entertainment forums to look at thousands of conversations being had about Netflix and Amazon's original programming. And as a means of competitor benchmarking, I compared these conversations against each other to see if I could uncover any audience insights into what makes the best content. And I found a few interesting things. So first of all, I found that Amazon viewers paid a fair amount of attention to the physical appearance of characters, 
with mentions of the token short ugly guy and speculating about how actors must feel over their casting. So these exaggerated and distinctive physiologies really stirred up a lot of conversation amongst them. Secondly, I noticed that Amazon viewers spoke a lot about their emotional reactions to shows. So they were 2.6 times more likely to discuss their mental actions and processes with words like bummed, care and sad coming through. And this 2.6 number is what we call the relative difference. So this tells us that Amazon audiences are 2.6 times more likely to talk about this than the Netflix audience. So it was really clear that Amazon audiences were very aware of their own reactions and sold into the emotional sides of shows like bad cliffhangers, for instance. And programs that did successfully tap into these emotional depths were overwhelmingly evaluated as good. Meanwhile, on the Netflix side of things, in terms of visual aspects, viewers were less concerned with physical appearances, but more so with animation. So particularly when discussing live action fantasy series like The Witcher, viewers surprisingly said that they would rather see it as an animated series and expressed that live action remakes aren't as good as their original animations. So it comes across that they're actually quite impartial to the impressive sort of CGI and scenery of these shows, because through animation, they could focus more on the actual content. And digging below the surface a bit, Netflix audiences were very in tune with the relationships between characters. So they were much more likely to discuss everything from serotonin boosting friendships to sort of teasers of almost relationships. But nostalgia was the really key component for Netflix viewers. They were 9.6 times more likely to use the word nostalgia to express what they liked about a show. And I feel like the success of the show Stranger Things really epitomizes this with its 80s references and soundtrack and costume design. And they were also more likely to use words like relatable and likable. And that paired with nostalgia shows us that viewers respond to content that they can connect with on a sentimental level. So overall, the audience insights we found from this research highlight how streaming giants don't necessarily need to pour millions of dollars into impressive special effects and technology, but rather they should focus on developing compelling storylines that tap into audiences' emotional intelligence and sentimentality. And on to our next piece, which is all about reactions to the latest installment in the Spider-Man franchise, No Way Home. So I do apologise if there are any Marvel fans in the audience who haven't had a chance to see it yet. I'll let you know when to plug your ears. Um, but for this one, we basically wanted to dig deeper into the reactions of three distinct groups who all have different motivations to watch the same film. So these were everyday moviegoers, so people who watch Spider-Man as a social activity. Marvel fanatics, so people who watched it because they love Marvel comics and the franchise as a whole, and cinema enthusiasts. So these are people with a keen interest in film or what we call self-proclaimed movie critics. And in order to understand the different motivations and reactions of each of these groups, we gathered audience data from Twitter to represent the collective views of the everyday moviegoer, Marvel fan forums for the fanatic and IMDb reviews for the cinema enthusiasts. And we then compared these three massive data sets against each other to find some really interesting insights. So firstly, for the everyday moviegoer, we found that they were much more likely to discuss never having seen another Marvel film. So phrases like never watched and first Marvel movie were coming through, showing us that more people were getting interested in this film than other ones which signifies some really effective marketing and also a lot of buzz stimulating them to watch it for the first time and find out what all the fuss is about. They were also much more likely to have an emotional response to the film, where they express feelings of happiness, sadness, fear and shock. So it's clear that the everyday moviegoer is much more invested in the narrative and allows the film to pull at their heartstrings. One really interesting thing that came through was the propensity for the everyday moviegoer to see the film more than once. So they were 10.9 times more likely to say that they're re-watching or seeing the film a second time, which is a huge difference in how they're speaking. And this presents an opportunity to market films like this on social platforms as so good that it needs to be seen twice. And moving on to our Marvel fanatics. So as I said, we went to Marvel forum data for this one. And unsurprisingly, they were far more likely to mention comics when discussing No Way Home. 
And this was mostly to reference the accuracy of the film in depicting the comic storyline. But it also came through that the film should be taken at face value because despite some discrepancies between the comic and the film storyline, they still really enjoyed it. And they acknowledged the challenge of having to adapt a comic to the big screen. And here's the big spoiler alert. So avert your ears if you don't want to know. Um, but Marvel fans were a whopping 35.1 times more likely to comment on the multiple universes at play in this film. And for anyone who doesn't know, in this film, all three Spider-Mans from the different films, like Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland, come together from their different universes to defeat their villains. Um, so naturally, the fanatics have extensive knowledge about this multiverse from the comics, but this is the first time it's actually been depicted on screen. So this was a huge selling point of the film for them and sparked a load of com conversation because they've been waiting such a long time for this to be played out in a Marvel film. And to go back to my earlier point, I feel like the element of nostalgia was definitely at play here with bringing back old heroes and villains from people's childhoods in a huge culmination, which is bound to cause some excitement. Also in the forums, they're much more likely to discuss Spider-Man's suit and technology. So this is a key difference that separates the Marvel fanatics from the other groups, because rather than speaking about their emotional reactions or specific moments in the film, Marvel fanatics are way more interested in the geeky details. And then lastly, onto our cinema enthusiasts. So there was a very clear separation of this group from the other ones. And what made them so different was their attention to the art of filmmaking. So they were 25.9 times more likely to comment on the cinematography and special effects of the film. They also, also closely analyzed the actors' performance, their on-screen chemistry, and the skills of the people like directors and producers. So they really dissected the film. And this kind of in-depth analysis re reveals a key characteristic about this group, that they very much position themselves as an authority when reviewing No Way Home. And something else that stood out was their use of the phrase fan service. And that's a term I'm sure many of you know to mean giving fans what they want in a narrative. And cinema enthusiasts made sure to point out moments of fan service in the film in order to judge whether or not it was overdone. But whilst Marvel fans might turn a blind eye to these moments and the general public really enjoy them, we can see that cinema enthusiasts are extremely objective in their viewing. So what can we take from this? This analysis showed us that different audience types do have their own unique reactions to films. And through comparison, we can better understand what they are and the reasons behind them. But this type of analysis is really important for filmmakers and marketers in understanding what motivates their various audiences to watch a film so that they can deliver targeted communications to each segment and appeal to broader audiences. So that's the first part of our agenda done. So moving on to the next section, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Simon, who, as I mentioned, is the head of audience and content planning at the Royal Opera House. So Simon, over to you. Hey Natalie, thanks very much, and um, hi everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's it's nice to be here to talk to you today. Um, I think you're going to see, and it's become very clear as I as I as I present to you guys. You're going to hear from me and from Angelina. Um, the two organisations are on quite different uh, places in their sort of journey in using tech and analytics. And, um, I think this is kind of um, representing the Opera House as one of Creative Insights, pro probably one of your newest clients. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the sort of challenges that we're facing and, and, and why we're using text analytics. We're looking to text analytics to give us those solutions um, because we don't know the answers to them yet. Um, but, uh, and I'm also going to say that because um, if you've got questions from the end, I'd be very happy to um, try and answer them. But I'm also very open to getting advice from anybody in the audience who's also got some ideas about, um, about how, to, how to answer these questions. But anyway, let me talk to you a little bit about what, what we do and who I am. So um, th these are all kind of builds, but like, for those of you who don't know or have never been to um, the Royal Opera House, it is home to uh, two very august institutions um, who, are, who are separate, the Royal Ballet um, and the Royal Opera, who are separate companies, um, have their own staff and everything else, and around for a long time, 
um, as well as the orchestra of the Opera House. And they all live in the same building. Um, the building takes up one quarter of Covent Garden, um, the Covent Garden Piazza, for those of you who've been. Um, and the, uh, oh, sorry, this is chat pop up. Um, and what people don't necessarily know is that there are two theatres housed in the same building, the, um, the, the main stage, but also the Limbury, which puts on um, newer work and uh, new work. And um, we are not solely uh, experienced on stage. We also have um, distribution. So you can catch our performances um, on tour around the world, but also uh, in cinemas, um, on radio, through um, BBC Radio, on TV, and, uh, and via pay-per-view streaming, um, and soon via subscription streaming. Um, and uh, you might also know that we are a global uh, brand with global audiences, over 4.7 million social followers across our channels, 90% of them are not in the UK. And I'm going to talk briefly about myself, just so you get some context, not uh, for any other reason. But um, just so you know, I am, um, I am new to the Opera House. Um, my role is as head of audience insight and content strategy is a bit of a hybrid role. So it is partly about insight and commissioning research that's going to help us understand audiences in the long way. And it's also um, partly about setting content strategy and thinking about the uh, performances that we capture, uh, how we describe and edit those performances, the extra and supplementary content we build around that. Uh, and I'm also responsible for thinking about rights and windowing of that content all the distribution channels we just talked about. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but because it's insight and content, it makes um, relative insight very relevant. <laughs> well, R's and I's there, um, to what I'm doing. So um, let me tell you a little bit more about our uh, challenge. So as, um, as Natalie said at the start, actually, about the shift in entertainment industry and move to digital, now audiences in the theatre are coming back to live performance. We are still seeing the demand for digital. Um, hasn't hasn't produced, um, which is great. Um, um, but COVID has presented some specific challenges for us. So the, the challenge that you know, I'm thinking about a lot at the moment is how we kind of move even even more quickly towards a kind of new audiences and digital distribution, digital content driven future. And that's because um, one of the one of the effects uh, that the COVID crisis has had is that the audiences who we used to rely on coming into our coming into our theatre and you know, it's still by far the largest share of our revenues, um, aren't necessarily going to come back at the same rate. And particularly where we have roughly 10 to 15 percent of our audience in the house uh, every season is from international travellers, for example, which isn't able to come at the moment. But also we're seeing um, fewer bookings from audiences who aren't commuting into London as much. And we're also seeing fewer bookings from um, older audiences who maybe have a bit, a bit more frightened of um, the risk of COVID. So, uh, on the other hand, we are seeing younger audiences coming in. So there is there is a shift there that we need to think about how we respond to that change in behaviour. Some of that is about how do we maintain the connection with our core audiences, those who support us in a post-COVID landscape. Some of that is about thinking about new audiences and how to serve them better. And of course, both of those are there different channels we should be exploiting, are there different types of offer we can be presenting and, and selling them. Um, and uh, the other big change is that, like many, um, live arts organisations, we have uh, had to rely on public funding. We, you know, we have public funding as, a, as part of our funding mix all the time, but in COVID, we are particularly reliant upon it. And that funding comes with obligations. Um, and those obligations include, um, yeah, thank you, um, how to diversify our audience and take um, our art forms to um, as many people as possible, particularly those who are traditionally underserved by the arts. Um, so. Those three things together uh, are thinking around broadening our audiences, thinking about new sources and um, ways of connecting and how we connect with audiences who are coming back or coming into the, in, into the theatre itself uh, in different ways and less frequently. Um, that's it, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the way in which we're hoping to do that, and this is our kind of, kind of strategy, which dwell too long on this, you know, I secret to decoding this. Um, what we are, our aim is to evolve the relationship that we have with audiences from what at the moment is a relatively infrequent but very intense, you know, three hour um, live experience to a more, maybe less intense across the, across the space of time, but more regular and multifaceted and continual presence in their lives. And I think 
that doing that relies on a couple of things. One is about um, offering experiences that uh, can suit different occasions at different, um, which, by which I mean sort of different times, different times of day, different times of year, um, but at different price points. And also um, how we connect to new audiences. Um, so our art forms, we'll talk about this a bit more in a second, our art forms uh, often can feel quite distant um, and quite exclusive and difficult to get to know. Um, but at their core, we believe they are universal. They're, you know, they're physical expressions of emotion. We believe they could be universal. And it's about how we find a way to connect those art forms with the broader public by telling meaningful stories. Um, it's also, uh, I, I'm not sh I'm, I can hear the people having trouble with the sound quality for me, so I'm, I'm not sure how to fix that. Um, but maybe I'll talk more slowly, or uh, if we can try, maybe maybe I can try without headphones. One second, let's see if we can disconnect them. Um, it might be this is a better option. Um, so sorry for this. If I if I take this off. I don't know, let's see if that's better for people. Okay. Apologies if, um, if you've missed any of my very exciting, inspiring content up to that point. So um, as I was saying, you're welcome. Um, as I was trying to say before, um, this is really about how we change the relationship with our audiences um, from infrequent intense to more um, present and continual. But hopefully not less intense, but uh, different shapes for different spaces in people's lives. And uh, our aim is to connect what we think is universal about our art forms, we believe are as universal about our art forms and now pure physical expressions of emotion to the broadest public um, by telling meaningful stories, but also leveraging um, all the different channels we now have to create valuable experiences for people of all sorts of shapes and sizes that fit into different parts of their day. Um, and that inevitably means, you know, we need to understand what our audience is like, how they connect to our art forms, how we can present those art forms to them. And if we get that right, we will also create new opportunities for our artists and for our art forms to flex and grow. Um, so if we flick on one, yeah, um, I'm going to talk sort of generally about the challenges that we're facing in a more specific, uh, or specific ways. One is about the valuable experiences. So we are currently in a, in a private beta where we're launching a streaming service. So up to this point, we've offered pay-per-view uh, performances that's been through a third party supplier. Um, and that was all we had to pivot to in the pandemic when no one was allowed into the building. But what we are doing now is building our own streaming service. Um, where people will, we will not only be able to you know, monetize our own content directly, but we will also be able to get uh, data back from our users and how. Um, but there are some challenges with that, which I'm going to talk about in a second. The other thing is around meaningful stories. So um, we are, as I said, uh, thinking about new audiences and trying to reach new audiences and experimenting with ways of talking about our art forms um, on social platforms, whether that is trying to bring stories um, behind opera directors to life, or whether that is using our talent, like Marcelina there, who's a principal royal ballet dancer, uh, to talk about content on moments that maybe reaches a broader, broader audience. Like so um, let me talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we're, we're, in, we're engaging um, relative insights to help us with. So, yeah, um, I won't dwell on this, but I mean, I, I find this kind of stuff really interesting, my job, I guess, but um, is thinking about the divides in our audience because um, it's, it's, it's a truism that people who are into ballet and opera or what you might call sort of classical culture, classical music, high culture, um, tend to be um, sort of brought into that world at a young age, usually by um, family, uh, family rituals. Um, either you've got family members who already enjoy those things or who are encouraging people to take lessons, um, either play an instrument or learning to dance, or who have sort of well-established family traditions. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your own family, it might be your friends, parents, what have you. But that, that's quite a, a common pattern that we see. And those people, you know, believe in the, understand the value of those art forms from an early age. Now, when we've segmented the market for thinking about launching our streaming service, there are, um, and then, you know, we expect our audiences in the first instance to come from those who know us well. And that sort of thing on the right, which is dead small, um, 
all you need to really see is that there are four groups and the red blobs are who we expect to sign up in the early stages of launch and the, the much bigger yellowy blobs are the potential size of their audience. So we expect to quite quickly um, sign up a lot of our existing user base, but all the future growth is going to come from people who have very little connection with us currently. who are younger, who, um, and particularly their audience are not right, who are more naturally streamers than theatre goers. So, um, you know, they are interested and curious, they're open-minded about our art forms, but they're not familiar with them. And I think specifically for this, you know, this, this group, um, they're not necessarily steeped in what is quite quite heavily coded experiences in terms of what people expect from the performances in the language that we use to talk about opera and ballet, um, which may be Italian or French for, for, for one thing. Um, and those codes are quite guarded and reinforced by a lot of our audiences when you're in a live experience as well. So um, how we think about um, or, how, or how we tackle that divide, particularly when you're launching a product that's going to work for everybody, is a thing that we're really interested in understanding as a problem and finding creative solutions to. So I'll talk about some of those questions now. Um, and yeah, I think where we feel very comfortable as an organization is um, in the language of aesthetics of expertise, the language of the stage, the language of uh, the luxury, very much a, a sort of luxury brand, but also our heritage and our exclusivity. Um, where we are less uh, knowledgeable, and I think you know, we, need to, we need to learn and listen, is um, how to talk about our art forms in the language of experience, of engaging curiosity in a world of streaming, um, making things accessible. Um, I put utility in as a sense of like where this fits into my life. Now, that they can be, um, certainly not for like three, three hour long performances, um, how we talk about relevance and how we talk about subscription and purchase um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a different sort of in a different sort of way. So um, I also mentioned there ballet versus opera, which I'll come on to in a second. But we think that is um, we need to learn how to speak in those um, in, 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 in these in different ways. And if I flick on to the next slide, here are some of the questions that we're, we're sort of putting <laughs> to relative insight and to ourselves, to editorial teams who, um, who, who create the content uh, on our site. Are there types of language actually that we think are sort of triggers or that tend to reinforce the divide between our two different types of audience that we feel like it's either not for me, on either side it's not for me. Um, and even within that, are there particular moments in, which, um, in, in a journey um, that using the wrong kind of language actually has more impact, you know, more negative impact for us. Um, on the flip side of that, are there approaches to the description that actually capture uh, an emotion or, a, or, a, or, or an idea that actually resonates well with both groups, which you know, would be great if we want to focus on. And um, as mentioned opera versus ballet before, there are there is a group of audiences that um, consumes both. I, I'm one of those, but generally speaking, people tend to prefer one or the other. And we're really interested in how we talk about the art forms, um, the, the opposite art form to fans of the former and find ways to uh, pique their interest, talk about the, the emotion and appreciation of those art forms. Um, there's an, another couple of questions on the next slide, which are um, got an example of um, one of our emails to, to, to new users, which is, I guess, again, thinking about um, a, a lexicon, like a, a, a set of language and an approach to using language, whether it be used on metaphor or, or, or something else, that can um, entice and excite users with you know, the promise of what's unique about these art forms, but also um, that um, engages with curiosity. We've got lots of content about how things are made, about how directors direct, and about how things to learn um, and practice. Um, and as I said before, um, for those who maybe aren't as familiar with the art forms, how we talk about the time and space um, that we wanted to take up in their lives and how to make time for it. We don't yet know as this is a new camp for us and a new audience for us how to do that. So we've got some guesses, but um, I mean, this is, I realize I put these images in far too small for you to see, but there's some examples of the kind of language we use and we tend to rely on words like kind of spellbinding, classic and things like that. Maybe we interested to see um, where, we, where we can go with that in terms of the nuance for language that we use. And um, all I've done so far, I realize is give you uh, questions and share the questions that we're thinking about. Um, I think the next slide will just be what we're, what we're working on right now. So. Um, I haven't got any answers to give you, I'm afraid. 
hope to see. But uh, we're working with Relative Insight because, um, as I said, we're committed to broadening access to our art forms and we know that codes are a barrier. And you know, not all codes, but certainly a lot of codes live in language and we need to understand that. Um, we're also launching new services that we need to help, you know, services themselves need to help users find something they're going to enjoy, even if they don't necessarily know what that is. And language is the thing that's going to help people gravitate to the things that sound right for them. So we need to understand that. And, you know, we already write a lot of content about content, but um, we do that in, for, for what is a relatively, you know, established and closed group. So we need ways of gaining insight into what resonates with other audiences is going to drive our creativity and give our editorial teams um, you know, inspiration to work with. And because we don't know the answers to these questions yet, and we also don't know how we're going to work them out, um, what we've done with Relative Insight is they've very kindly given us a very flexible um, deal. So we've got a year's worth of access to the platform for 15 people across you know, our CRM team, our editorial team, our marketing teams. Um, and uh, within that, we've um, they've agreed to give us one project which they're going to manage for us. And probably I'm going to give them the, the, the trickiest job about understanding the divide between audiences and get them to help us with that. Um, but they've also given us two open ended uh, self service projects to run where we are using, as long as we're using the same, same data, we can run them for a time. And that's really for us to be sort of sandbox for our editorial teams um, and, and our user research teams actually to understand themselves how to get the best value out of the platform whether it's a tool that we can start to rely on and can really help drive the way we think about communicating our voices going forward and that's where we are right now thank you Sorry, just needed to unmute myself just there. Thank you Simon that was really interesting um so I've got a couple of questions for you myself so Firstly, what do you think will be the most useful application of Relatives tool for the Opera House? Um, I mean, that's a good question. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, for me, I'm most interested in thinking about language and codes and what, and what language is exclusive and forms a barrier versus that's welcoming. Um, because I'm really interested in, in, in language generally. I'm, it's a fascinating topic how it relates to thought and stuff but i suspect that we might find you know the power of the platform is its ability to do this kind of brute force comparison as you were showing with the spider-man type examples so it may well be um that you know something like so at the moment we're just doing loads and loads and loads and loads, and loads of user testing with the streaming platform it might be that actually going through user testing verbatims and finding out what's really, really resonant and what's really different might end up being the kind of use case that's much more utility driven, but is <laughs> rather than kind of, you know, intellectually driven, uh, it might be much more useful, but I think we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, definitely. No, that's really interesting. And then secondly, this is a big one, I always get asked this. So how will you know whether the investment in relative was worth it? That's a question too. I mean, um, uh, well, I, I think the, the simple answer to that is um, whether the teams who are, it probably won't be me, it will be the teams who are writing editorial, who are writing programs, you know, we still sell programs in the, in the, uh, in, in the house, um, or the teams who are, who are putting out our CRM, or as I say, who are feeding user research back into the design teams. I think it will be how useful they find it and how much it they come to rely on it over the course of the next 12 months will probably tell us how that is. Fair enough. Interesting. And also don't forget, guys, so there will be an opportunity for plenty of audience questions at the end, um, but just make sure you're adding them into the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, but now let me introduce you to Angelina from Self Esteem Brands. So Angelina is their Senior Director of Consumer Insights and Analytics. And yeah, I'm really excited to hear what you've got to talk about as well, Angelina. So take it away. It would help if I unmute myself, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that's brilliant. Um, so Self-Esteem Brands, uh, a very <laughs> complicated company. Uh, we actually have several different brands uh, that fall underneath the corporate. And so it's incredibly important for us to understand how we understand the different audiences across each of these brands, uh, because they are very unique. While there's a lot of things that are certainly similar, 
um, there's nuances that are just so incredibly important to the brand themselves. And so it's very important for us to understand that. And legitimately, I, I'm a very lucky girl. I get to work for a brand that the purpose truly is we're trying to raise the self-esteem of the world. And so we need to truly understand um, what matters to our audience, what matters to our consumers, so that we can best reach them where they, you know, where they need to be. So um, I'm going to talk specifically today about how Relative Insights has helped us with our three fitness brands. And um, the next slide, um, we currently have three brands, which it might seem like, oh, they're, you know, they're all fitness brands. So they're very similar and you would come at them the same way. They have the same audience, but they're in fact quite unique um, and differentiated from each other, even though they're all fitness brands. So what do they have in common? Um, they are all fitness brands. Um, they are very much a captivated audience. So these are individuals who have chosen truly to be part of a community, um, very different from your normal transactional type of relationship, I think. Um, our, one, our one similarity to the Opera House, hey, we have the bar method, which is very similar to ballet. It uses ballet techniques um, in the fitness. Anytime fitness, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's the lead. Um, anytime fitness is actually the largest fitness brand in the world. So we are located on all seven continents. And yes, we do have an anytime fitness in Antarctica. Very exciting. Um, and it for that brand, um, it really is, it's a gym and it's about being accessible for all types of individuals um, who, who want to work out. And then we have Basecamp which is also a studio brand, much like the bar method. Um, but in this situation, it uses uh, scientific techniques to make for a very high impact and efficient workout. So you do some spinning, but you also do some strength training. So as you can imagine, even though these are all technically the same end, right? Fitness and exercise, um, they have very different audiences. And so it's incredibly important for us to understand that. So, how, you know, really, how do we go about addressing um, ways in which we can differentiate not only between our own brands, but also the competition. And at the end of the day, the way we chose to go about it is through understanding what really matters most to our audience. So what do they care about? And in order to do that, we actually use two different segmentations. So um, the first segmentation that we use um, in the next slide is health and wellness segmentation. And so this is understanding the audience from a very much a more broad overall wellness perspective. So it is everything from how individuals approach their health, leading the way, this is an individual who their health and well being is everything to their life. They are really always thinking about it and they are integrating it into everything that they do, all the way down to get through the day, where this is an individual who may be struggling. Um, they have other priorities. There's, you know, there's lots of reasons why health and wellness is not, you know, number one um, in your mind all of the time. So understanding individuals from this sort of overall perspective in health and wellness is one of the ways we understand our audience. But the um, second way that we also look at them is through a fitness and exercise segmentation. And so this very specifically addresses the idea of how do I integrate fitness and exercise into my daily life? And so from here, we have everything from a fitness fanatic who, right, is very confident about fitness and exercise. They feel very capable and they're figuring out ways to get it into their routine all the time. So this is your individual who is very purposefully using the stairs instead of the elevator every day, um, all the way down to homebodies. And again, this is somebody who just fitness and exercise isn't necessarily a priority in their life. Or they may, you know, let's be honest, COVID has changed priorities for a lot of us. And so whereas somebody may have been a fitness fanatic before, um, since COVID, you know, now they're more of a homebody. Like it's really about the creature comforts. And I just don't make uh, exercise a priority as much because I have to focus on other things like my, my mental um, well-being. So for us, this is really interesting because it, 
helps us think about how our brand voice um, also aligns with the audience that it best meets. And so um, the bar method recently, this brand um, is going through a brand refresh. So we're really thinking about how we put that voice out there and how we're thinking about our audience and how we're best meeting them. And what we have found is that um, one of the the segments that best meets the needs for the bar method was not a health and wellness segment. It was actually a fitness and exercise segment, and it's those guidance seekers. And so what we saw here was that um, this audience is, these are individuals who are looking for something that is very effective, highly effective, but it fits into a very busy schedule. So, uh, you know, honestly, most of them are moms. They are women who are trying to do it all and also understand that their health and wellness is incredibly important to things like their mental well-being as well. So they understand that connection um, and they, they want to manage it. We found that when we were looking at this particular segment um, and when they were talking about fitness and exercise and why it's important in their life, they talked about words like strength. So it's not that I'm trying to lose weight necessarily, it's I am trying to build up my strength. I wanna feel stronger. I'm thinking about managing stress. Uh, these individuals identified themselves as learners, which I think is really interesting, right? So not only are they using fitness, but they're also thinking about it in new ways and innovative ways. And they use the word consistent. And I think this is really interesting because what we were hearing from them is that I need something that I know I can rely on that will really fit within my schedule because I know that if, if it's fitness and it's gonna work for me, it need, it's something I have to be consistent with. So I have to have a reason, I have to have something that keeps me committed um, to this exercise routine because I know that that's the best way that I'm gonna see results. So we then took um, these words, if you will, um, when we were doing the segmentation research, and we wanted to look at what are the types of things they're saying that really drive where they go to, to exercise um, and how often. And then most importantly as well, we still are a brand and we have a brand voice, right? And so we wanna see where these types of opportunities align for our brand as well. So the bar method is a very specific, um, it sounds crazy, but there's actually different approaches to just doing bar. So probably doesn't sound crazy to Simon, he knows. There's lots of different approaches to ballet. But um, for the bar method, uh, it's very specific in that it sticks to the true original research that created the bar um, as a workout routine. So it's very precise movements that are meant to engage different muscle components. And so it's very targeted. And, um, you know, there's a lot of jokes about how, oh, they don't use shoes. You know, how hard can it be? You're using socks. And it's like, actually, you'd be surprised how much harder it is because you don't wear shoes with the bar method. So um, we want to make sure that we figure out not only what the audience is saying, but also what aligns well with our particular brand uh, differential. And so uh, you see here some of the things that really stood out was this idea of it's intelligent and it builds lean muscle and um, figuring out how we differentiate from competitors around some of these things. Where granted, there are some things that the competitors offer that we realize we also can, uh, can zero in on and take from them. So on the next slide, um, this is kind of what we do. Um, in-house at self-esteem is we like to create sort of our brand cheat sheet, if you will. And it's really about understanding our brand personality at a high level. So everything from what is the brand benefit to what is our brand purpose and forgive the boxes. Um, it is a very competitive business. So I could, there's certain things I could share and, and I apologize, I know. Um, but uh, I, what, what is interesting is that when we define our brand personality, we really focus on these words because these words matter um, and they help us focus a lot of the work that we do. So you see here for the bar method, the words that really resonate for our brand personality and meet our audience where they're at is elevated, intelligent, welcoming, determined, and confident. And so what does this mean? So on the next slide, when we start thinking about what our brand looks like and what our brand sounds like, 
We're like, how do these words all come together um, in you know, one particular uh, brand beacon? And so for the bar method, it was this idea of powerful. Um, I am going to the bar method because I want to be powerful. I wanna do it in, a, in an intelligent way, in an elevated way. I wanna feel confident, but I still want it to be welcoming. And so some of the fun of utilizing words in this way is that you can actually bring them into the creative process. And so our amazing creative team, when they were looking at photography for brand messaging, they were very specifically looking at, okay, how do we convey confident? How do we convey intelligent? And how do we do that in a powerful way? And so um, that's really what I mean when I say, hey, we, words matter to us. Like we really think about these words um, because we know that they connect with our audience in a meaningful way. Our other brand that it, um, oh, and so because we're going through the brand refresh right now, no, it's okay, yeah. Um, because we're going through the brand refresh right now, what Relative Insight has allowed us to do is take an evaluation of where we are currently in our social media and on our website. And we wanna make sure, right, it's like an audit, if you will, are we using the words that we wanna represent as a brand? And so uh, this is just kind of a fun one. Um, when, we, when we were looking at our website for the bar method, one of the things that really stood out to us is that we were using the word modifications a lot more than our competitors. And we had to kind of reflect on this a bit. Oh, yeah, relative insights, we're reflecting. Um, we really had to reflect on this and say like modifications is that, like that's the exact opposite of powerful, right? So what is another way that we can convey this idea of granted some people do, you know, they're gonna need some modifications, um, but how do we pivot this? So it's more about, you know, creating the right powerful lean muscles um, to offset any, you know, injuries you may have. Um, and also what we're hearing from our audience is they're not interested in a workout that's highly accessible. So we have to get away from this idea of, oh, it's good for everybody and anybody can do it. and because that's not actually what, the, what our audience wants, right? Our target audience wants to hear that this is not for people the first time they're working out. This is an elevated way, an intelligent way of working out. So um, interestingly, our other brand um, on the next slide is the um, Basecamp. What we found again, a studio brand that it very much was targeting a specific fitness and exercise segment. And so again, um, right now with Basecamp, uh, it's a very small brand, we're, we're just uh, launching. Um, so it's still kind of in the baby stages and how uh, we use this information. But we're again, already you know starting to think about what is the difference in the words that matter to that particular segment? And so, um, what we find is they're, you know, much more of an appeal to those fitness fanatics. So people who are trying to figure out how to do fitness all the time. These are individuals who will do the bar method and do base camp and also have a membership at any time fitness. So um, it's interesting in understanding them and the types of words that they use. And on the next slide, you'll see it's very similar in how we approach, right? Um, thinking about what is the brand personality and even though these are both studio brands and it's very much individuals who are thinking about strength um, and thinking about how to get a workout and exercise routine into their schedule, uh, the words like electric and animalistic, like this is your beast mode type of exercise. So these are people who are looking for more of an energy when they're working out than the bar method. And I just thought it was so funny because some of the words they're so similar, but there's just this tiny little difference in nuance. And um, for the bar method, one of the words that kept coming up was elevated. Well, for base camp, one of the words that kept coming up was uplifting, which when you think about it, they're very kind of similar, but one has more of like a social um, sort of contract behind it. So we started thinking about that and what that means. And so um, for the bar method, it's powerful, right? And so for base camp, um, on our next slide, you'll see it's almost the same, but not quite. Our brand beacon for base camp is fierce. So if you want to go, you can go, yeah, there you go. Um, it's again, very intense workout, 
highly efficient. The bar method's the exact same thing. It's very efficient. Um, both of these are very rooted in science. So uh, the, the base camp as well um, from university research, like what's the best way to raise your heart rate and then um, integrate strength training only takes 35 minutes. So it fits in a schedule, right? The bar method, same thing. They were all about that schedule, wanting the fitness schedule. But here there was more around this idea of, right, that animalistic beast mode and also more around the social um, aspect of it. So that interaction. And so you go from powerful to fierce, which could very be very similar, I think. Like if you look them up in the, in a thesaurus, you might find them. Um, but there is definitely a nuance that we're able to pick up with um, because we do this kind of analysis where we're thinking about the words that really resonate. So finally, our last brand um, is quite different. Um, as I mentioned, Anytime Fitness is uh, what we find is for individuals who are gym goers to um, something like an Anytime Fitness, you hear them talk a lot more about accessibility and they're talking a lot more about their overall health and wellness. And so for Anytime Fitness, our segmentation focused more on two segments that are from the health and wellness perspective. The first one is I need a plan. Uh, these are individuals who you know, have been trying to use fitness throughout their entire life and they, have, they just haven't found something that's quite stuck. Um, or they feel like they really need help to figure out what's the best method for them, what works for them. Or maybe they just, you know, it's legitimately, it's like, hey, I just need constant um, motivation. I need somebody who can help me um, put a hand on my back, really tell me that they're there for me and make sure I'm doing things in the right way. Um, our other segment that we found Anytime Fitness really resonates with um, and going to a gym really resonates with is not right now. And I, it's so funny because when you look at not right now, you really see your guidance seekers. So that segment that we um, find that we're really reaching with the bar method is possibly a very specific uh, part of this not right now segment. Um, there is actually some overlay with the other segment as well. But what we see here is it's an individual, usually women um, who are very busy. They have so many priorities. They tend to not put themselves first, right? Uh, you know, it's take, oh, we got to take the kids to soccer so we can't, or football, sorry. Um, you know, and so I can't have time for a workout. It's another thing on my to-do list. And so they really need that flexibility. The difference here though, is that when we took the time to really hear not right now, um, the difference between the bar method and anytime fitness is, this is not somebody who's looking for that highly elevated type of experience. Um, this is somebody who needs something that feels more accessible and is readily available to them. So for anytime fitness, uh, when we look at the brand personality, so again, very similar to the bar method and base camp, and we look at theirs on the next slide. We see here that it's words that um, are like smart, likable, clever, empathetic, and unconventional. And you, again, it would be very easy to say, well, smart and clever, that's really close to intelligent, right? Or clever is very close to innovative even, but there's these slight nuances that really show you when you take them in combination with the other words that matter, that we get to this idea about being more accessible and being more of a coach. And so um, for the Anytime Fitness brand, this is where we found our real differentiator is that we have this opportunity to reach individuals who need this empathetic training. So somebody who's truly a coach, who truly understands um, where they're coming from and can help deliver it to them in a meaningful way. So on the next slide, um, we um, had do brand trackers and it's very much about trying to understand what are the words um, you know, that come to mind when you think of Anytime Fitness. And the feedback we would get is it's 24 seven, it's very you know, convenient, 
we wanted to get to that. What does it mean to be, um, you know, belonging and coaching and trainers? We want to lift this up. So what we're able to do with relative insight is on the next slide, you can see we can actually track our social media. We can track our website and make sure that we're constantly reinforcing these ideas of personal trainers and um, and those success stories. So what is meaningful to the audience telling them that they're um, sharing with them those success stories is incredibly powerful. And finally, we're able to use these words in brand trackers. So we also have a vendor partner where we take the time to make sure every quarter, um, where do we see these words resonating for our brand and how do they resonate across all of our segments? Sorry, a little trouble unmuting just then. Um, but, oh, sorry, I've gone through a couple of slides early. Um, that was really interesting. It's so it's so interesting how much of a difference those slight nuances can make. Um, but yeah, just a couple of questions for you. So do you have any favorite linguistic nuances that you found when doing this research? Um, yeah, it was really interesting to us that we did, um, the audiences picked up on this idea of science. Um, and it was actually something that came across for Anytime Fitness as well, that individuals are really interested in thinking about science. And I think some of this is just trends um, since COVID that people really care about fitness that, uh, you know, is that a doctor would approve of that is based in science so that they know it's going to work and is meaningful. And so we're thinking a lot about that for Anytime Fitness as well. How do we integrate this idea of science into the methodology? That's really interesting. And I'm just conscious that we've got only one minute left. So I'm going to jump to the questions from the audience as well. Um, so Simon, we've got a few for you. So um, first one, so there seems to be so many use cases for the Royal Opera House in terms of audience data and insights. But off the top of your head, are there any key differences between people who like opera and people who like ballet? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I know. I know a bit about this from other sources, actually, if you're super interested, I can talk to you about ballet. But in, in, the, in, the short, in the short package, um, ballet audiences tend to be more, um, more likely to be women, more likely to be older, actually, if you're really into um, ballet, uh, particularly classic ballets. And um, we find that contemporary ballets attract a, a, a different audience, a, a younger and more mixed audience, but classic, classical ballets and older female audience. Also, they have a quirk, which is, um, if you're an opera lover, you're probably going to come and see the opera each production once, and you're going to choose the best cast. If you're a ballet fan, you're probably going to come and see the same production. If you're a super fan, you're probably going to come and see the same production maybe one or two times, maybe even three times, and you're going to look for seeing a different principal in the lead role each time. Amazing. There you go. <laughs> um, and then Angelina, for you, so you've spoken about like what you've done with Relative, but so sort of where where are you off to next? I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many opportunities. Um, I think for us, we are especially excited about the idea of doing more research um, so that we can get at ideas around concepts. What we're seeing is another big trend, right? Digital content, um, needing to make things very accessible for individuals who, for, who sometimes need to work out from home. So I think that there's a lot of value in from relative insight in thinking about search terms that individuals might use when they're looking for digital content and how we can better position some of it around that. Amazing, okay. And then secondly, what effect have you seen taking a segment specific language and conveying this in the brand beacon has on engagement with the brand. Yeah, it's definitely the biggest value from focusing on your segments is that it's very obvious they feel heard. So uh, with the brand tracker that we do in combination with Relative Insights, uh, what we're able to see is we actually see quite a bit of a lift with those segments that we're targeting around this messaging. So where we might not see, um, you know, some of the, the other segments resonating with that coach idea, we see that those two segments that we're actually trying, and then as well as a third segment, we see this idea of coach really resonates with them and they're picking up on the messaging very well. So I, you know, as long as you know that the message is one that you want to share and that it's going to reach your audience, tracking it, I think is so incredibly important because it's also not only saying that 
hey, yes, we hear it loud and clear, but also, yes, it resonates with us in a meaningful way. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I think that's probably a good point to finish on then. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to our speakers as well. Um, if you would like to, oh, Axel, my mouse is going crazy. If you would like to access the two pieces of research I spoke about today, then you can scan the QR codes on the screen. And also, if you'd like to get in touch with me, then you can scan my LinkedIn QR code there. So that should take you straight through to my profile and you can connect with me on there. Um, but yeah, we'll also be sending around a recording of the webinar to everyone. Um, but I hope you enjoyed it. And please do keep an eye out for the next installment in the Spotlight series. And we'll see you all soon. <laughs>